Gentlemen, if you please come on in, take your seats. Our program is about to begin momentarily. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, our program is about to begin. Gentlemen, the stage is yours. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our panel today. Uh, the topic is celebrating and uh, selling to the growing middle class. Uh, I think we have an excellent panel lined up today. Let me just introduce myself very briefly. Uh, Donald Tang, I work for DE Shaw Group. Uh, we're an uh, uh, alternative investment manager uh, based in New York. I'll let the panelists uh, introduce themselves first, and then uh, I guess we'll get uh, straight to it. So, Achal, if you please. Yeah, thank you. My name is Achal Agarwal. I'm the president Asia Pacific for Kimberly Clark. Uh, we've got brands like Huggies, Cotex, Kleenex. Got, uh, we deal with the essentials in life. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Hello, my name is Timothy Chen. Um, I'm the head of business development and sales and marketing for VIA Technologies. Uh, we started out as a semiconductor company, uh, evolved through the number of years. Uh, one of our consumer brands is HTC. It's a uh, smartphone company. Um, I'm, I'm also the chairman of a company called Cashplay, which is uh, considered the Netflix of Taiwan. And we're expanding into uh, ASEAN countries as we speak next year. Yeah, my, my name is Kevin Liu. Uh, I work for the uh, Swiss private equity firm called Partners Group. Um, we're headquartered in Zug, a little town outside of Zurich. And our Asia regional office in Singapore, we have close to 200 people here. Uh, we're really active in the mid-cap space. We, de we deploy about eight, nine billion dollars of new capital a year, with the AUM about 47 billion dollars today. And uh, previously, I was with the World Bank for a number of years, both in Washington and in Asia. And I'm also affiliated with INSEAD uh, as one of their fellows. Thank you. It's great to be here. Peter. Hi, my name is Peter, last name Tan. Uh, with Knowledge Universe, uh, we deal with education up to uh, K-12. Uh, so from virtually cradle to, uh, to 18 years old. I've uh, been with this business for about 18 months. Prior to that, I was in a totally different industry. Uh, I was in the burger industry with Burger King, McDonald's, and prior to that, I uh, was in investment banking um, after graduating from uh, B school. So. I did my B2B transformation, banking to burgers, and now it's education. <laughs> Glad to be here. Great, so maybe if we could start with a very uh, quick statistic. There's a massive growth in the middle class expected over the next few years. You know, currently, depending on the definition that you use, there are two billion consumers that comprise the middle class uh, around the world. By 2030, uh, by some estimates, uh, that number will be closer to five billion, which is an enormous uh, amount of growth. Um, even more interestingly, though, much of that growth will come from Asia. You know, Europe and America currently uh, account for probably around 50% of the middle class today. Uh, by 2030, that number is expected to drop to 20%. In turn, Asia's share will be more like two-thirds, which has huge implications uh, for, for businesses today. So I guess to start, um, because of this massive shift in consumption from, east, uh, sorry, from west to east, uh, most companies are already looking towards China, towards Asia, uh, towards India for growth. Um, for some, it's happening already. For some, it's going to come in the near future. Um, what does this mean for your business? And if we could have the panelists each in turn kind of give their quick take on this, and then we can get into a more uh, lively discussion. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Uh, well, clearly for us, it's already arrived. Uh, you know, Asia Pacific for us is definitely a growth engine uh, and is going to be growing faster and faster for us. And, the percentage of the mix in terms of the revenue is certainly going to shift in favor of Asia. Uh, the other things which are significant for us is that uh, a lot of innovation is going to happen here. Uh, this is now the most competitive market across the world. And uh, with the growing consumer needs, we're going to have to make sure that we innovate um, aggressively. And the third thing is that with technology spreading across the region and the middle class adopting smartphones and uh, getting onto the social network, 
uh, this is going to be really disruptive. It's already starting to happen in countries like Korea and China, uh, where we're going online in a big way. But uh, uh, I see this as a big trend, which is going to make a big difference in terms of the kind of business models that we operate. And we're already shifting resources uh, in order to manage that shift. Well, I think I'm, a, I'm already a benefactor of the growth of China, or the emergence of China. I'm also a benefactor of different waves of technology. Uh, back in the mid-90s when I started VIA, when I joined, we were 100 plus people. Now we're 3,000 plus people. When I joined, we were $30 million in revenue. Uh, at our peak, we did over a billion dollars in revenue. When we started HTC, literally it was two guys and myself on the side. We had three people. Now we have 17,000 people. We do over $6 billion in revenue a year. Um, and I think that was, what you say, the growth of the middle class and the emergence of China. And from there, then we expanded globally um, elsewhere. So I'm already a benefactor, like you said. It's here. What are the next uh, areas of growth? Uh, that's a question that we grapple with all the next. Sure. Okay. Yeah, um, I think, uh, Donald, you asked about the implication of the rise of middle class on our business. I think as a, as a private equity firm, um, if you look at the, the, the deals we do these days, um, almost, I, would, I, I wouldn't be have a scientific number, but a very large portion of the deals we do today, you can find that angle in terms of the consumers, middle class, emerging market, right? Even if when we make acquisition in Europe, you know, typically, you know, one of the first group of questions is then, okay, how do you, in addition to stabilize or modestly grow the business in Europe, where else do you find um, the, 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 the points to grow the firm, which inevitably is about the middle class, it's about Asia, it's about other parts of the world other than Europe. And uh, um, in Asia, uh, that's, that's even, even truer, right? So the, one of the latest deal we announced that we uh, uh, acquired a $450 million uh, company in Guangzhou, which is a Spanish company, but really headquartered in China, uh, which costs which, uh, which, 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 which produces the guided elevator rails, right? There are a number of ways to look at that, but in the end, if you look at that particular business, you know, elevators in China, you're thinking about middle class, you know, in, in, if you know China very well, you'll know that, you know, in the past, any, any buildings that are lower than five stories, really don't have elevators, right? But these days, as people's lifestyle getting better, the demand those things. So even for, for very hardcore manufacturing firms, you, mm -hmm. you, you see that angle. And uh, my only other point I would make here is that I think people tend to look at the rise of middle class as a sort of bottom up, sort of um, very organic things when economy grow, people get better life, they demand more things. And, uh, but I, I would just uh, remind all of us that I also think there is a very strong policy slash government angle, right? If you, if, if you look at China, which is probably going to be the largest um, rise of, uh, of middle class, which, which we are seeing and we will see in the foreseeable future, the, that rise of middle class is inherently linked to the whole process of uh, people moving to the cities, right? The urbanization, which is a big policy, policy objective. Uh, Premier Li Keqiang, particularly, I think he sees everything through the lens of urbanization. And I think one of the consequences of urbanization, when people move from rural areas, go into the cities, demand different services, infrastructure. And so I, I think the policy angle cannot be underestimated as well, even though uh, the rise of middle class fundamentally is a bottom-up organic social phenomenon. Peter? Just picking up on um, Donald's uh, earlier comments about the growing middle class, um, I, I think it's important, and, and maybe I'll frame it a little bit differently, um, it, it's, it's a significant growth, you know, whichever data that you're looking at. Call it we're at 1.6, 1 1.8 1 billion globally uh, in the middle class. And this would, over the next 15, 20 years, get to 3.2, 3.3 billion. Uh, it's, it's a huge increase. Um, and, and this increase is going to be largely uh, contributed by Asia. Um, and if this is not a megatrend or another megatrend, I don't know what how you would frame it. Uh, the, last, the last megatrend that I can remember is, the, uh, is, is digitization, which created a whole generation C, I think it's been uh, referred to as uh, the, the connected uh, generation. And with, every, with any megatrend, there's always opportunities 
to sell more diapers, uh, to sell more smartphones. Uh, but at the same time, this opportunity is not guaranteed. Uh, and I think governments, private enterprises, uh, we all have our part to play uh, in ensuring that this growth doesn't get derailed. Um, if, if we think back, and I, I can't remember for the longest time, maybe over the last 50 years, um, Asia has experienced uh, the longest period of prosperity and, uh, and harmony in, in, in the region. There, there are infractions here and there, there are issues, but largely it's gone very, very peacefully. And um, I, I believe uh, Donald also mentioned about uh, large consumer-facing companies um, uh, uh, harping on this, uh, on this, on this huge uh, potential. Many have already done so, uh, the likes of um, uh, Kimberly Clark. Um, those of you who were not here last night at, at the uh, discussion with uh, Tarman uh, might share some data points which I, uh, I, I like to repeat because I think that these data points are extremely, extremely uh, uh, interesting. Um, if you took U.S.-based companies investing outside of the U.S. from the period of 2001 to 2011, 10-year period, investment into Germany, 630 million, up 5 percent, France, 470 million, down 14 percent, U.K., a billion dollars, up 2 percent, Brazil, half a billion, up 63 percent, India, 770 million, up 700 percent, and China, 1 billion up 350%. Another data point which I thought was interesting to share is um, the EU and US combined in 2009 accounted for 51% of middle class consumption. This table will totally turn if projections come true and I have no reason to, uh, to, to think otherwise in that Asia is projected to account for 55% of middle class consumption by 2030, and the US and EU uh, will account for only 21%. So the opportunity is immense. Um, I, in as much as I, I think it's important to figure out how do we benefit or how do we sell into this burgeoning uh, middle class, a, a, a seismic move, a, not a, not, a sh not a change in the demand curve, but an entire shift of, uh, of the demand curve. I think it's also important to think about what we do to ensure this. Um, and, and, and to finish off, maybe just, just to leave it uh, with, with uh, all of you here is, um, I think if we, if we read, a, a, call it you know, economic theories, uh, practitioners, um, there seems to be a very strong correlation between the Gini coefficient uh, and the political instability of a country. Uh, and, and if you look at the, the two largest um, uh, economies here, India and China, and you know, taking China as an example, I think uh, it's been popularly, uh, popularly reported that the Gini coefficient is anywhere languishing around 0.45 which is very healthy. But there's a large gray economy where the income <coughs> and the wealth is not evaluated or taken into consideration when you factor in this Gini coefficient. And when I would think that if that was factored in, the gap would be extreme. Um, and, um, and, and it's little wonder that uh, President uh, Xi Jinping uh, is spending a lot of uh, focus on uh, corruption and graft uh, because if anything at all, um, political stability is something that is, is so important uh, in, in, a, in an economy like China that uh, will ensure that uh, the middle uh, income growth uh, does not get uh, derailed. So I've been... Okay, so I, I think we'll come back to that, uh, that theme. How do we actually ensure the middle class continues to grow in a productive manner? But I guess for, for, for starts, maybe we can shift a little bit uh, back to kind of the product and services side. Um, you know, Kimberly Clark, obviously, is a company that's 
uh, has to innovate to survive, innovates constantly, and uh, creates new products, right? adapts products to local markets. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm curious if you can share a little bit with us um, how you think about that process of innovation, adapting products to local markets, creating new products maybe solely just for uh, Asian markets, and how do you generally channel your innovation uh, within Kimberly-Clark to, uh, to serve consumers better? How does that process work? Yes. You know, uh, there's been a lot of talk now about the fact that when will um, innovation move to Asia and whether there will be innovation exported from Asia to other parts of the world. In Kimberly-Clark, that's happening. Um, we have, in Asia Pacific, the best products in the world. Um, we've got an innovation hub in Korea. We've got an innovation hub in China, um, in Australia, and in ASEAN. And uh, uh, this is the most competitive market in the world. And therefore, and with the rising middle class, with the needs increasing, um, clearly the need for innovation here is very strong. Uh, we've got, you know, we've got Japanese competition, we've got U.S. competition, we've got Chinese competitors, uh, and everyone's going towards the price. So uh, innovation uh, is absolutely essential, <clears throat> and the speed of innovation here is uh, outpacing any part of the world in Kimberly Clark. Uh, we are three generations ahead in terms of product development compared to the U.S. And uh, you at the U.S. is actually taking what we are innovating here and taking it back. So uh, things which are being talked about in terms of futuristic terms is already happening in the company. The other thing uh, which is happening out here in Asia is that with technology spreading so fast in terms of the middle class with smartphones and them getting onto social media, the business model innovation is taking place here rapidly. Uh, we've got in Korea, something like 65% of our business now online. Uh, in the last two years, we've gone from almost zero in, to, in online business in China to 35%. So it's moving very rapidly, and we're seeing the change right across the world. And we're marketing in a digital world. And the lines between online and offline are actually blurring. Um, and it's the consumer experience uh, which is now becoming uh, important. Uh, we used to talk of CRM, now we talk of CXM, which is the consumer experience management. You can't, uh, we used to broadcast to the consumer, we used to play advertising, we used to send messages to the consumer one way. Uh, we can't control the message anymore uh, because if there's an experience, positive or negative, it's posted very quickly and, uh, and everyone hears about it, everyone sees it. And so the, what we are trying to do is we're trying an omni-channel approach. We're trying to be out there. We've got to communicate. We actually start our relationship with with mom, the moment she gets pregnant, um, uh, you know, we want to start being thought of as a trusted friend. Huggies must be the trusted friend of the mom. Cotex must be uh, the trusted friend of all women. Uh, and uh, therefore, we provide information. We have uh, a dialogue which is taking place, uh, and we are guiding um, the the woman through uh, through her maternity, guiding her through how to look after a baby. Uh, and therefore having, becoming a trusted partner with her. So the brand experience has become much, much more important than simply selling a product. And so this is happening very, very quickly, and we are having to really shift resources away from the traditional media and advertising and into more innovative spaces. And it's a constant uh, effort to try and keep up with this and try to be ahead of the curve. So it's very exciting. Are you managing all this out of, out of Singapore? Is it, a, is it a global effort? How, how do you? No, it's a great question, and that, that's a debate which took place in the company in terms of, you know, we've got global resources and we've got resources out here. What became pretty clear is that you cannot manage it out of anything but within the country. Mm -hmm. So Korea has its own effort, China has its own effort, <coughs> uh, Australia has their own effort, etc. cetera. Uh, but what we do is we share best practices, and we make sure that there's a connectivity which is taking place, and that's by frequent uh, phone calls, video conferences, etc. so that we're sharing among ourselves, but clearly um, China and Korea are actually leading the world at this point in terms of uh, what's happening in this space. Uh, and of, obviously you, the US uh, has a lot going on, but the speed at which it's moving is actually quite breathtaking. As I said, you know, think about China, two years back nothing, and now 35% of your business is online, and Korea 65 to 70%, so it's really moving fast. So <laughs> people buy Huggies online? People are buying, well, Huggies is, it's pretty intuitive, right? You think of a mom, she doesn't have time, 
right? Uh, she can touch and feel the product at the store. She kind of figures out what she wants to buy. She goes online, she's got the shelf, she sees the pricing, what's competitive, and she buys, and they get delivery. So it's ideal for a mother. It's also, we, you know, we, we also deal with adult incontinence, right? And so uh, there's a bit of stigma, unfortunately, attached to that, right? Which we're trying to remove. And uh, therefore, people can go online. The caregiver, you know, maybe the son, the daughter of the, uh, of the old person can go online and order. And so these are bulky packs. No one wants to go to a supermarket and people don't want to be seen carrying the adult incontinence diaper. And moms don't want to go there because they don't have the time. So it's actually very convenient. So our category actually lends itself uh, to this. Okay. Very interesting. A question, I, I, a question uh, Charles. Um, you mentioned earlier about emotional benefits. The, the classic functional benefits and value, how, how important is that in, in, in the world of digitization now? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, when you're, when you're in a product category like us, you think of a mother, there's nothing more important than the child being comfortable. And therefore, the functional uh, attributes need to be absolutely something which is front and center. You don't want a mess. You don't want uh, the mother to have to spend time cleaning up a mess. Uh, you think of Cotex, the sanitary pads, right? Uh, any woman in this room will tell you that it's the self-respect of a woman, right? You can't have a leak, right? And so uh, if there's a leak, then there's a, there's a breach of trust which is taking place. So uh, the functional attributes are kind of going to be given. And I think every company is going to make sure that they reach a point where that is not an issue, right? And so the, differenti the differentiation between two brands is going to be the experience. And it's a total experience. I was at the Harley Davidson factory just about a week back. I was in the, in the US. And they were talking about the fact that they, um, they're training their dealers to give the Harley Davidson experience when a person comes in to buy a bike. Uh, because they want the experience in totality. It's not simply getting onto the bike. It's the whole experience. And so if you think about a brand now, I think what we're dealing with is how that brand interacts with you in the digital space and in the real world, both. And so the products are going to keep getting better and better in terms of innovation. We can't stop that. But if you just have a better product, that's not going to work. It's going to be a trusted brand is going to be one which engages with the consumer. Excellent. So, so Tim, you own and manage several media and tech businesses. And we've talked about kind of experiences. Um, it seems like a good time to, to ask you, I guess, to elaborate a little bit, uh, maybe about leisure, entertainment, and kind of how that plays into the, the growth of the middle class. Honestly, the light is blinding me, so I've, I've seen blind spots. But let me comment on your first stuff. And where I work, um, the interesting thing is I, I, I've always said in the last year, innovation may be the most overused word in technology now. I mean, look right there. It says milk and changing the world in innovative ways. So at VIA, we talk about other things. Uh, we talk about invention. Uh, people forget that uh, in the 60s, it was the, uh, the investor of transistor that led to the birth of Silicon Valley. It was the invention of Netscape Navigator at Urbana um, in Lillian Champaign that led to the birth of the internet. So nowadays we say, hey, let's stop being innovative. Uh, let's try to be inventive. Um, and let's reimagine the world 20 years down the road. I mean, so if you look at reemergence of China 20 years ago or even 10, 15 years ago when we talked about the smartphone, about a piece in your hand, people laughed at us. So when we talk about media, uh, one of the major trends we see is what is the convergence of media and technology? Um, so people say, okay, Tim, you're trying to do cash play. You're trying to be the, net, net, the next Netflix. Or you guys acquired a controlling stick in TVB because you guys want to be the next Asian CNN or the next Asian um, Al Jazeera. Um, I look at that differently. Uh, we have our plan of how we see 10 years down the road of where we imagine, or we say reimagine the world to be for us. And the other thing is we don't target the middle class. It's in fact, when we talk about the middle class, middle means average. And I don't think we want to be average. We either want to target the people at the fortune of the bottom of the pyramid or the people at the upper class. I mean, my kids now, they're seven, asked me the other day, even though I'm part of HDC and was somewhat insulted, um, told me, Dad, I want to buy an iPhone 6. I said, you're seven years old. Why do you want an iPhone 6? They're already thinking about luxury. But that luxury is coming down to the middle class coming down to the so-called poor. So I, I have different varying opinions of this, of, of how I see technology. And getting back to technology, I see technology, as you say, empowerment. Uh, and technology is the way for the middle class to move up to the upper class, or the poor 
to move them to the middle class or to the upper class. 10 years ago, where was Twitter? 15 years ago, Jack Ma was a high school teacher. Now today, he's going to do a $160 billion IPO. That is technology. That is empowerment. That is going beyond the middle class. And, that's, and I think Alibaba, and congratulations to you for D.E. Shah being part of the IPO. Uh, but I think that's technology affecting the middle class in our society today. Do, do you have any examples of uh, what the world might be in 20 years' time? Oh, that, that's a really complicated question. But uh, one of the things that I see is um, I'm really, and I don't know if I should be saying this here, but I'm, I'm a big believer in the cryptocurrencies and blockchain. I think the way we see money today will be very different when we see in 20 years. I think no longer will we need to go to a bank and have an ATM. I think we will have our banks in the pocket of our hands. And not only that, we will have sensors that will know how we feel. Right? I don't know if that's really good. Right, but how we feel, how we interact, and that data can inform us to do other things. I, I, I'm a big believer in the day of singularity, when man and, and humankind will merge into one. In fact, I signed up where one day in 10 years or 20 years, I'll cut out my head and fusion into a robot. I want to be half man, half robot. But my belief is different from what other people believe. But, but you know, reassuringly, 20 years from now, we'll still have a lot of babies. Yes. Who need diapering. Need right? diapers. But they may yes. be half mad and important. robot too. But they still need diapers. <laughs> but if you have too many robots, then they, 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 there's no need for diapers. That's a problem yeah. for you, actually. But <laughs> what happens yeah, to robots? But, but those robots may have leaks, so they can use Kotex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, on, on a more serious note, uh, Peter, your business is, uh, depending on where you are, heavily regulated. And you mentioned earlier that there is uh, a need to make sure that you know, we're not only considering things from the corporate perspective, from a private enterprise's perspective, how to uh, sell to, how to make more money, how to you know, exploit the middle class, but also how do you make sure that uh, all the constituents, right, all the stakeholders have uh, something to gain uh, from this? Uh, could you talk a bit about uh, the role of government uh, you know, in your business and how you balance you know, private, public, and different needs like that? Yeah. Well. First of all, I think all of us in, 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 in the private sector, we I hate is probably too strong a word. Uh, we do have issues with regulators. <laughs> uh, on a good day, we say we understand and, and we accept. On a bad day, we probably have a bottle of wine and go to sleep and say nothing. Um, but I think. Um, you know, to me, that, that's, 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 a, that's an important point. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's a very strong moral responsibility, I feel, that we as private enterprises uh, should have. Um, and, and, and simply because, going back to the earlier point I made about um, if you have a, if, if you want harmony, prosperity, peace, you really need to have stability. Political stability um, is, is, is first and foremost perhaps uh, the easiest to, to identify with. Uh, and, and to have that, um, I think a more, uh, a, a, a society where you don't have the extremes of the haves and have nots uh, is, is going to provide a much better platform to achieve that. And, and we all know, and we see this uh, throughout history that a, a, a peaceful uh, environment leads to uh, a significant growth, faster growth. Um, so this goes back to the point that we all need to make money for our business. Um, we spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of money investing in um, our employees, uh, team members, uh, to ensure that they're selling right, to ensure that they're uh, having all the right uh, tools. Um, but I think it's important as well to step back and say, all right, is it important to just know how to sell, uh, what to sell, but what about the whole governance thing? Um, do, are, are we comfortable that the people that are representing the brand, uh, that they understand what is right, what is wrong, what is governance, uh, how far can they go, and, and you've seen this happen uh, in, in, in the recent uh, few months. Uh, the oil situation in Taiwan, uh, the meat scandal in, uh, in China, and, and, and the list goes on. So 
so as, as, as we spend a lot of time thinking about how we uh, push our product and services uh, through uh, the channel, uh, I, I think it's important to step back and say there is a, also a heavy uh, and, 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 and a self-vested interest as well to uh, ensure that um, this moral uh, responsibility is educated and instilled into the, uh, the people that represent the brand. Uh, we're, we're trying to do our best uh, at, at a very, very young stage because I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's important to have that foundation uh, built. But I don't think it stops at K-12. It, it doesn't stop at uh, grade 12. It doesn't stop at you know, college. Uh, it, it needs to be a, a continual uh, a process. Um, so it, it, it perhaps might be interesting to understand from a, a child uh, in terms of your uh, training uh, uh, and development, um, uh, your perspective on, on that. But Sure, yeah, talent you know, development. Uh, yeah, we, the, the interesting thing is that when you think of the changes in the world taking place, uh, um, who understands these changes best are the young people. And therefore, one of the things which we figured was that as the uh, shift is taking place, uh, uh, we're moving away from advertising to doing stuff online. How do you buy media online is a new experience. How do you engage with the consumer is a new experience. And therefore, what we've done is that we've taken millennials into our organization. And it was very revealing for me. It was just an experience where we'd taken the chairman of our company to for a visit to China about two weeks back. And uh, there was a presentation done on digital. And there were three millennials making the pres presentation. And uh, the way they were talking was, um, I, I think I understood most of it, but I only think I understood. Uh, but they were absolutely comfortable with, uh, with the fact that they were talking to the chairman of the company. They were talking about the Huggies apps. They were talking about how they're going online and doing stuff. And so it just was quite an experience to see um, how you know kids 20 year olds are in the company and are leading the charge um, in terms of the most important part of our business. Uh, so that, that was just uh, uh, quite an experience for me. The other thing I think in terms of talent uh, would be that uh, there are a couple of things which uh, I would say is happening, but, but let me just hand it over back to you because I don't, you know, uh, I guess I answered the question, I think. Yeah. I mean, please, please continue. We, okay, we, so, uh, so uh, just, just on the talent front, I think a couple of interesting uh, things that I, I think the audience here might, be, might like to know is that uh, how, how do you retain talent? Uh, you know, with the, with the growing middle class, there's also a lot of mobility, a lot of, uh, we all know in India, China, et cetera, there's a lot of change taking place. How do you attract, how do you retain talent is becoming quite a question. And um, what I've always believed is that uh, you've got to have a winning culture, uh, which leads to a winning team. And if you have a winning team, then everyone wants to come on board with the winning team and stay there. And uh, uh, you know, I could talk a long time, we don't have the time today, but about how to create a winning culture and how to communicate uh, what winning means and making sure that the team understands that they're winning irrespective of whether they hit a particular target in a particular year or not. Uh, the other thing which uh, is uh, an interesting thing which is happening for Kimberly Clark where I think we are differentiating ourselves from most other multinational companies is that uh, uh, there's always this debate, there's matrix organizations and where do you flex towards? Do you flex towards the country or do you, do you flex towards the region or, this, or the center? Uh, and I think most companies are flexing more and more towards the region or towards in fact, the center and business units running out of the US or wherever they're based. Um, we, as a conscious decision, have flexed towards uh, the region in terms of uh, owning the PL. And uh, indeed, in Asia Pacific, what, uh, what we've done is flexed massively towards the country and empowered uh, our general managers in the country. And um, if you think about that, you cannot empower unless you have very, very capable general managers because you can't empower the incapable. And therefore, you need really outstanding talent out there. But the fact that you're empowering enables you to get the right talent because people want to be empowered and want to do stuff. So 
Um, it's a model which is really working for us. And if you think about Asia Pacific, where we're talking about all these massive changes taking place almost on a daily basis, to think that you can run um, this business out of, say, Dallas, which is where we're based, or even out of Singapore, where I'm based, uh, is not possible. You've got to empower. You've got to have broad strategies, but you've got to let the MDs actually work very, very fast in the market and make decisions. And I would, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd say that uh, today, I believe that we are one of the faster companies and most entrepreneurial companies uh, in the region in, in this kind of space because of the fact that we've empowered our general managers. And it, it attracts, it retains and engages, and it develops people. So every, all three things are happening. Um, and finally, I would simply say is that we've got one more advantage in terms of uh, attracting and retaining, which is that we are a global organization. We are under-indexed in terms of Asians in the US and other parts of our global business. And what we need to have is a representation of the leadership which represents our consumers, and the consumers are here. And so that's very well understood by our board and by the company, and they are therefore asking for Asian leaders to be sent across. So, uh, I can always, uh, I actually do that with almost every em employee that I hire, that I'm, I'm hiring you not for Asia, but to become a global leader. And within a year and a half or two, you've got to move you know, out of Asia, perhaps to another region or to, the, or, or, or to the US. And for that, you need leaders who have learning agility. So if you think about uh, you know, the three things that I'm saying out here, which is having a winning culture, uh, having an empowered organization and having the opportunity to move out of their home countries and, and get into other parts of the world, it's a very attractive proposition and it develops people phenomenally. Okay, well, maybe if we can go back to Peter's point on uh, your food safety and, and things like that. I mean, to me, it seems like there's a role the government has to play in that, right? Um, you know, Kevin, you've, you've spent quite a lot of time in uh, working with government in government organizations. Obviously, you're in finance now. You've been in academia. But I'm wondering if you have a, 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 a viewpoint on, on this. You know, what should governments be doing to uh, implement policies to, you know, to, to, to assist the middle class? And you know, is, is government nimble enough to respond to kind of the challenges that are coming? Thank you, Dada, for the question. Um, I think on the, on the topic of the role of government uh, in this context of the rise of middle class, consumption growth, et cetera, maybe let me, let me make two quick comments. One is particularly on China, right? Uh, for those of you who sort of monitor the, the, the sort of big debate that are going on about the, the, the economic growth of China, which is obviously partially driven by this large rise of the middle class, uh, which the government is trying to create because the, the huge income di di disparity never helps any country to, to actually grow in a healthy way. That debate tends to be framed around people versus the government, right? How, what's the role of state-owned enterprises? What is the role of individual consumption or household consumption, to the more accurate economic terms, in, the, in, the sort of, uh, in, in, in China's growth story? So I think one, one, one point I want to make here, I, I think most people are missing the points here, right? People think this economic rebalancing of China is going to be something that is, they're going to switch off from the investment-driven, the government-driven model to something that is household consumption-based, driven by private sector. I, I really don't see that coming. I, I, I don't think, number one, that, that switch can be done easily. I mean, if you look at the numbers, let's say in terms of the household consumption as a percentage of GDP growth, there is no way, it doesn't matter how strong the government is to drive the economy, you could switch that off in months or even years, right? I mean, so that's, 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 that's an important point. We don't, we don't sort of contradict these two things. In fact, what, 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 you, what, you, what you see in China, especially the last 18 months or so under the new leadership, is that they are not trying to do that switch. It's not an on and off switch. What they are trying to do, for example, is to continue to invest, but with the quality of life in mind, right? We talk about, uh, Peter mentioned about food safety, and, 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 and the government is really trying to continue to invest, not to say now from now on we're going to grow because middle class, uh, middle class people are going to consume more, but try to shepherd that sort of, it's almost a collective consumption. I don't know whether that's a co correct phrase, but it's like collectively the government is trying to shepherd that consumption from the middle class or other people towards somewhere, and that become a driver of the, of the growth, right? The second point I would make is I think 
for China, India, and many other large emerging countries, I think are very, very important, is that um, the question here, it's really a question, right? Can the middle class people of these emerging countries, emerging economies, really look for the lifestyles that the previous middle class people in the West have enjoyed over many, many years? Right. So can, can they look for the American lifestyle, middle class lifestyle, and therefore, oh, that's what we should be? And the same question for the government, for the policymakers. You know, is it your objective in Singapore or in China to eventually <coughs> lead your people to enjoy the type of middle class life that in Western Europe or US are enjoying? I, 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 to me, intuitively, the answer is no. Because the, the, the type of resource concentration, the requirement of resources you need to maintain that type of lifestyle of middle classes for the, for the Western countries, I just don't think you can accommodate that given what we have. Therefore, the next question is, what type of dream? If it's not America dream, what is a China dream? What is the India dream for the middle class people of these countries? How do you define that? How do you still motivate people to work hard towards that dream? Right. I think that that's another point I would say policymakers need to worry about and, and, and we all should, should really think about. Can this world, this earth, handle the type of lifestyle of the middle class in the past? And you would say the answer to that is? Uh, to me, the answer is clearly no. To me, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the bigger question is then what? You know, you, you, got, you got, I mean, these people, you, you, you cannot say, oh, because, you know, you're too late, you, you cannot enjoy a good life, the, the, the good time is over, right? That, that's clearly not the answer. I think the, the answer is what alternative vision that we collectively have to come up with for the, for the middle classes in the developing countries, that is something that people still look forward to, that still creates opportunity for the business, whether it's technology or, or consumer business. And, and for us as an investor, it, it's the same question, right? If you think of the alternative vision, what that vision should be, and therefore what type of companies we should buy in order to contribute to that process. That's, that's interesting, Kevin. Um, you know, if, if you were to fast forward uh, 20 years, you think it's at all even likely that people will look into China and say, gee, you know, I'd like to have that China dream. We talk about the American, uh, the American dream now. Maybe it's the China dream. Maybe China will leapfrog. Uh, you know, if you look at everything uh, that's happening, uh, it, it would uh, seem very possible, or at least plausible. That, I agree. That I agree. we would be talking about, gee, you know. I agree. Or our grandkids will say, ah, that's the China dream that I want. So, Kevin, what, what is the China dream in your viewpoint? You haven't answered the question that Don was asking. I, I think, oh, no, I, 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 number one, I don't know what the China dream is, but I think collectively that's something we need to, we, we need to define, right? And to me, there are certainly a key points in that, in that China dream. Uh, which is different from the traditional Western social development, right? One is, I think, the issue of individual versus collective, right? I, I just think the, the traditional Western value put too much focus on the individual right, individual preferences, you know, uh, choice is a good thing, but, but frankly, when you, when you go to a supermarket, you choose Pepsi and Coke, right? You feel good, you are choosing, but does that really make any difference, right? When you, when you check out in a grocery store, you get to choose between paper and plastic. You think you are doing something for the environment. It is really making a difference. So I think one, one thing is this individual decision making, the, the good feeling associated with making individual choices versus collective goods, right? For a, for a country, I don't think the Chinese government necessarily choose to do a more collective way for any moral high ground, right? It's just it's such a difficult country. If you lead, let everybody make the same level of choices as, uh, as the US or Western Europe, the country is not governable, right? So I think one element of China dream is to, is, is to redefine that balance between individual and, and, and the collective interests. The, the other, I would say, is um, maybe go even further. I don't, whether, I don't know whether I would agitate some of the more Western uh, audience here, is that fundamentally there's a question about democracy, right? And, I mean, why is electoral democracy, one person, one vote, in a very retail way making decisions, necessarily more superior than a slightly more top-down system? So you don't believe in democracy, is that? <laughs> no, I, I, I think democracy is a wonderful thing, but but are there ways to improve that 
that you can avoid some of the problem you see today in the, in the, in the Western, Western well, politics. Well, to your point, I think you're talking of resources. I think the first dream, perhaps, that the Chinese have is to have clean air, right? I, I mean, the, the point you made, I think, is really valid. If, you, if, we are, if, if China and India are to go to the consumption levels of the US, I don't think we have a planet left. Mm -hmm. uh, Chuck, can I comment on that? Because a year ago in Beijing, the pollution was horrible. Remember that, Donald? And I remember walking out, and I saw someone with a face mask on. And he took off the face mask, and he was smoking. And I was like, why are you smoking? He goes, oh, because the cigarette smoke is, is less harmful than the Beijing air. And I sat there, and I was like, wow. Our, the pollution issue in Beijing will be solved in five years, because necessity is the mother invention. Yep. And when the pollution is that bad, I think China's, especially China's leaders, are in Beijing. They can't be that air. I mean, even in their own selfish self-interest, they have to solve the pollution problem. Right. But getting back to the China dream, since I'm Chinese, I'm going to tell you my dream. Yeah, what's your dream? I mean, when we grow up, I remember, you remember the days when we felt inferior to the Western world? I mean, we felt, we looked to the West and we saw, oh, the U.S. is the paragon of, of what we need to be. So I, I think the uh, Chinese dream, first step for us, or at least for me, is the revival of China. Uh, I think we were embarrassed in the opium wars. Uh, I think we want, at least I want to see the reemergence of China and have its rightful place in this world to be a leader, to be respected. And that, to me, is the first phase of the China dream. The rest, I'll worry about it later. I mean, that's, that's for me. I don't know about you, Kevin. So my, my, my version of it is it's certainly not two, yet, uh, two SUVs per household. So. That'll resolve the pollution <laughs> issue. Um, I think we're about to run out of time here. Um, so maybe, maybe in closing, um, I, I just saw a, a quote that was uh, relevant uh, earlier today. It's, uh, it was in an article. It's from Aristotle. It says, uh, great then is the good fortune of a state in which the citizens have moderate and sufficient property. For where some possess much and others nothing, a tyranny may grow out of either extreme. Where the middle class is large, there are least likely to be factions and dissensions. So I guess it's, uh, it's very fortunate that today we're talking about the growth of the middle class, and uh, I think we should all celebrate it. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>